Uh, thanks for joining us today to talk about how SREs can help organizations adapt in all this. Um, you know, some, a lot of us have been talking about this. I've had conversations with Alex and Liz about it. And we keep wondering, like, what what can we do? So um, those of us that blame us for asking the same thing, like, what can we do? And uh, we thought we would get these very smart people together to talk about that very topic. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with 40 minutes of panel discussion with our guests. And then we'll leave 20 minutes at the end for open Q&A. So think of your questions as you go. Pop them into the Q&A panel in Zoom. Um, my colleagues will sort them all out for us as we go. And when we get to the end, then I'll, I'll read them off and uh, our panelists can have at them. So for now, introductions. I'm Amy Toby. I'm, I'm going to be moderating today. I'm a staff SRE at Blameless. I've been an SRE and DevOps practitioner since before those names existed. I love this community and believe that SREs are uniquely positioned to change the world in small and large ways. And going alphabetically, I'll let my panelists introduce themselves. So starting with Alex. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Alex Hidalgo. I've been an SRE for about a decade now and uh, it is a something that truly speaks to me. Um, I kind of wonder how I ever did anything else before. Um, I'm currently at Squarespace and uh, currently in the process of writing, implementing service level objectives, which um, I hope will be well received. And Dave. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Renson. Uh, I'm an SRE director at Google. Um, I've only been in SRE five years, so I guess I'm the puppy uh, of the bunch. Um, I was one of the uh, principal editors on the uh, SRE workbook and am pleased to uh, be contributing to Alex's book as well. And it's lovely to be here and see everyone for some value of C. Thanks, Dave. And Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Fong Jones. I'm a principal developer advocate at honeycomb.io. And I've also been an SRE. Um, I consider myself both an SRE and dev advocate. And I've been around SRE for the past uh, 12 years. And I've been working in the DevOps space for about the past 15 or 16 years. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And so getting started, uh, I kind of want to start with a question about, uh, just to go right into it, error budgets and development velocity. And it seems like there's a lot of teams out there that are running with reduced personnel and available spoons or cognitive capacity, right? Because we're all dealing with this. And so uh, the three of you have a lot of expertise in this space uh, and kind of how these regulations work. And so how can these practices help teams cope and adapt? So uh, let's, let's, start with, let's start with Liz. I think I've seen a couple of bad examples of how to cope with this. And I've seen a couple of good examples of how to cope with this. The bad example is a uh, end named bank in Europe that is that divided their teams up into the blue team and the green team and mandated that the blue team come to work on alternate days with the green team so that you would only lose half of your team. And that way you could still keep the services running and keep the de uh, deployments running. And that's a bad example. I don't think that we should be doing that. I think that we need to be a lot more kind of continuous with our resilience practices that we need to accept that people are potentially going to have less throughput. Uh, that people are potentially going to be less available. And instead of kind of dividing things into the blue team and the green team, let's instead think about how do we actually make it so that people can swap in and out of on-call depending upon their parenting needs? How do we make sure that people can continue to push out releases according to automated release trains so that if someone does feel like writing code, they can still get that code pushed to production? I think that's kind of the direction that we need to be headed instead. Hmm, I really like that. Um... I feel like uh, I'm going I'm to save you for last, Alex, because I, I, I think you have a lot to say about this. So uh, let's go to Dave next. Um, sure. So I think I've seen a mix of things that went really well and things that went uh, that are going not well and then some realities. So uh, I agree with Liz that um, the scenario she described is generally an anti-pattern. But I would like to acknowledge that there are times when it's kind of a requirement particularly when you have people who have to have physical contact with some infrastructure. So like we have had double and triple split teams in our data centers at Google because the humans have to go in and do human things to the equipment that just, we haven't invented the robots to do it yet. So that's, it's not optimal in, in, in all the ways Liz described, but it's, it's just a requirement. Uh, things that have gone well, well, the same things have gone well and have gone badly. 
teams that have been good about paying attention to their technical debt and their toil, right? Meaning keeping their toil volume low. So being very proactive about giving to the computers the things that computers are capable of doing um, are generally faring better uh, having to work remote than uh, other teams who didn't. The teams who haven't been paying as much attention to their automation or keeping their toil under control are finding they're having a really hard time because doing toil uh, really doesn't scale when everybody is remote just because of the communication friction that being remote uh, adds, especially to teams that are not used to, to having to interact uh, over video conference principally. Um, so that's both a, a pattern and, and an anti-pattern. I, I will say one last thing. Uh, one of the conversations we were having internally today about SRE leadership is, um, you know, this is a global pandemic and it's awful. Uh, but as long as it exists, it provides a really interesting natural experiment to ask how many of the principles that we practice in, in SRE at Google and other places are A, scalable to the degree of, you know, global scale pandemics, uh, and, and what edges do they expose, you know, things we have to rethink, or maybe aren't true, or as true as we thought they were. And so, I mean, if you're looking for sort of a silver lining in an otherwise fairly gray cloud, I think that'll be pretty interesting as it emerges over the next few weeks. I like that point about resilience. And uh, Alex, what, what do you think? So I think one of the most important things that everyone has to keep in mind, especially the way you put it, error budgets, right? How do you think about what is a tolerable amount of failure in times like this, especially perhaps in terms of what does your release cadence look like? What are you expecting from your humans? And people often, when they think about SLOs or they think about error budgets and they think about the windows that these are calculated over, you know, the, the classic example is out of error budget, focus on reliability, have, have error budget remaining, uh, release, move, do whatever you want. But that's not really how to best use those numbers. The real, I think, best way to use kind of the concept of an error budget, even if you don't have specific numbers for this, right? It doesn't mean you have to actually have measurements and, and all that. But the concepts behind it is it just gives you a different way of thinking about things and to have good discussions with people with that data and to help you make decisions based upon that. So I often tell people that you should revisit what a target is whenever you need to. Sometimes it's because you had an incident. Sometimes it's because your code base changed or your dependencies changed, right? Things change about the world. And sometimes you have to change your expectations. And, but I also tell people do that whenever you need to. And right now might be one of those times. Right now might be one of those times where you have to stop and say, what makes sense? What makes sense for our users, for our engineers, for the product team? Uh, in some cases, I could see this being an example of where you need to make things a little more stringent, right? Uh, Zoom is very important right now. Uh, Netflix is very important right now, right? But there's also perhaps chances where maybe you don't need to focus as much on something because you need to prioritize correctly in this current world. Yeah, so, people yeah. first, right? Like, you know, it turns out that your service going down 1% more is probably actually acceptable if it means that people stay home, if it means that people take their kids to the hospital if they're getting high fevers, right? Yeah, exactly. Also, you know, this is a moment where teams have to make cognitively uncomfortable choices that maybe this product I was going to launch or this feature I was going to launch that my users will really like just isn't that important in the context of everything else that's going on. And we're just going to stop and divert resources to other things. And it's, it's painful in the sense of it was never frivolous, um, but maybe it's relatively frivolous to the current time. Yeah, and we can think about global prioritization as well. I saw actually this morning and have signed up for the uh, New York State uh, Tech SWAT team that is being dispatched to deal with uh, coronavirus. So it's kind of almost like doing a, uh, a potentially either a USDS rotation or similar, but for 90 days, or even just like volunteering services, right? Like these are things that we can all be doing to make sure that we as a, as, as a group of human beings survive. Like, I also like building off the point that Dave made in terms of perhaps you don't need to ship this feature. Uh, maybe you do, right? There's this new uh, service called My Bodega that wasn't planning on launching until later on in the summer. And they were trying to, from the start, their whole concept was they wanted to allow bodegas and corner stores to uh, more profitably deliver things. 
And uh, so their plan was always to only charge 50 cents for each delivery, uh, as opposed to things like caviar and seamless that can charge upwards of 30%. Um, so they always kind of had the, the, the owners of these small businesses in mind in the first place. So what they've done is said they launched early. And they said, look, everything may not be perfect, uh, but we're launching early. They're not charging anyone. They're it's a 100% free platform to use as long as things are currently, you know, like in the state um, that, that things are currently in. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes for greater good, perhaps you do throw something out there as long as people understand it may not have been as polished at, at, as you would originally hope. Uh, yeah, I like I that. Is, Go ahead, Dave. Oh, sorry. I mean, I, I was just going to say, you know, uh, listen, Alex, no. One of the things that happens, like when you have a service outage, and one of the things you worry about is what is going to happen when you restart the service, right? Like what's the crush of built up demand and how do you, you measure it or monitor it? And there's some really uh, interesting things like in the health system that um, we have to start paying attention to, like what happens when this abates. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you one uh, that sort of, Kind of amusing in a sense we're paying a lot of attention obviously to uh intensive care beds and ventilators and respirators and like those are obviously things we need to be in triage space those are things we have to be paying attention to but with you know approaching half the u.s population and a billion people worldwide all shelter in place don't laugh when i say this it's probably a good idea to also start paying attention to what our maternity ward uh, capacity is going to be 40 weeks from now, because uh, I think we'd be foolish to assume there won't be, shall we say, an uptake um, in that case. And, and that problem, if you will, is generalizable to a lot of things. Uh, like now is actually probably, even though we're in the height of this crisis, and, and at least in the U.S., we're expecting things to get a lot worse over the next couple of weeks. Um, now is actually probably the time to start thinking about how, what are the ways when we restart that we want to restart things so that we don't uh, cause immediate overload and crush everything. Yeah, it's that um, when you turn the service on, right? Like you know, you have to turn it on with exponential back off. You have to turn it on with with uh, with jitter, right? Like if you don't do that, then you just get immediately inundated the second everything comes back. Yeah, like I've already been imagining, thinking about what is it going to be like the first day that New Yorkers are allowed to go back out to the bar, and not oh, just gosh. in terms of how busy it's you know like it's going to be. But what kind of safety measures should we have in place to ensure that people who are probably going to drink a bit more than they normally would, are they going, are they going to be able to get home safe? And, you know, you, yeah, these are all things that we need to start thinking about now. Yeah, and there's capacity turned down almost everywhere. Like the ride, even the rideshare systems are running at lower capacity right now, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And in New York, it's sufficiently bad that um, that many drivers are driving around and not able to find work, such that the city actually stepped in and said, we are going to hire rideshare drivers to carry critical medical supplies from place to place, uh, rather than have them drive around looking for passengers that won't turn up. Hmm. And there have been fascinating uh, frenemy things happening, right? So some of the rideshare services who uh, might putatively compete with like food delivery services are starting to partner with them so that they they can still give rides and hours to their drivers and don't lose them permanently except now they're just they're delivering food to people instead of people to people hmm. that's that's really good adaptability there um so like we, we talked a little bit about like we we need to uh, to, to plan for the capacity as we emerge from, from the, the lockdowns and quarantines and so on. So, um, and going back to where we started a little bit, so how do we create the accountability at, while balancing that with compassion, right? Because there, we, we need to create that pressure, right? This is why we have SLOs and things to, to, to do that capacity planning, right? And so I guess what are the successful strategies that you all have seen in the world for kind of starting that process and getting that process going. Because as SREs, we often are the people saying, you know, crying in the dark and going, we really got to turn up capacity before it's too late. And um, sometimes we're not heard. So what 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 can folks do? Uh, let's the start strongest... with Alex this time. Oh, I don't know. This is a tricky question in terms of our current situation. 
because it's kind of uncharted territory, right? You can do your best when you're talking about any kind of capacity planning or any kind of feature launch or any kind of product launch. And you can try to use the data that you have, right? Uh, that's that's what all you can do. No one can really predict the future. Um, you can you know, throw all sorts of stats at what numbers you do have and perform regression analysis and, you know, but that's still not really telling the future. And sometimes I think the best you can do is make a guess, but be ready to change it, right? Um, that's what, like, resilience really means, right? It, do you know what to do and can you, right? That's not, like, uh, yesterday I cut myself pretty badly. I was opening an avocado because I wanted to make some guacamole. Uh, robustness is the fact that I have this other hand. Resilience is the fact that I am first aid trained, Red Cross certified, and I knew exactly what to do and I had the tools on hand to do it. So even though this was unexpected, I certainly wasn't planning on cutting myself while I was trying to make some guac, it happens. But the resilient aspect of that is the fact that I knew what to do, I was prepared for it. So I think we have to kind of take a similar, a similar view on how we turn both services and society back on in these times, um, we're not going to know. Take a guess, but try to be as prepared as you can possibly be. And have feedback loops, right? Like, you know, maybe we don't let all of New York City come back to work at the same time, right? Like, you know, maybe we increase capacity a little bit and then increase capacity a little bit and then discover, oh, wait, we need to back off, right? Like, the, if the more you have adaptability and flexibility in your system, the better prepared you'll be. Do you have anything to add, Dave? Yeah, a, a couple of, a couple of things. Um, first, um, here's where good, well-designed incentives uh, play a role. Um, we were talking about error budgets, but the value of the error budgets are the incentive alignments they create, right? If you're over your error budget a lot, the SRE team's gonna hand back to pagers. That's a super oversimplification. Um, so we're starting to see some of these things, like in the early days in most countries, you started to see hoarding. Right, that was, and that was terrible. People go, they clean up stores, they buy 14 years of toilet paper because I don't know, they expected uh, uh, COVID-19 to make them all have Kumar or something. Um, or they bought three years of perishable goods, which made no sense. And so now stores are starting to respond and do really good things like, oh, okay, sure. That first unit of hand sanitizer is the normal $4 and the second unit, uh, two for $80, right? That's a, a good incentives response, which will keep people from hoarding, or stores opening early only to service uh, elderly and at-risk patrons. Right, those are good responses. But I also want to piggyback on something Alex said, which I think is maybe the most important thing in all of this. I like to tell people that it's not a sin to fail. The sin is in failing to notice. Like whatever we do, it's going to be wrong the first time. That is a metaphysical certainty. So to Alex's point and to Luke's point, like it's all about the feedback loop and, and the monitoring and noticing that things are going off the rails and having the levers to adjust and try something new. You know, if you can, if the, uh, let's say the blast radius of your mistake is sufficiently small, you can afford to discover the right thing to do by first discovering all the wrong things to do. I also really like that point about how people were really hoarding things and in some cases, still are depending on the store. Uh, it, it also leads to, I think, kind of uh, the need for you to ensure that you're communicating things well, right? In my neighborhood, suddenly all the toilet paper was back and someone I know just a few neighborhoods over in Brooklyn still couldn't find any at all. And I didn't know that or I would have let people know ahead of time. But as soon as I found that out, it was just on Twitter, I was like, oh, go to this store at this intersection and this store at this intersection. And this person was able to find the toilet paper they needed. And maybe that could have happened much earlier if we knew what we had to communicate to each other. Now you can't always know what you need to communicate, but that's just, you know, like another, I think important aspect. That's how you keep things reliable, making sure that everyone who needs to know knows. It's kind of interesting in that I've been following the efforts by a group of aviation uh, professionals. Uh, it's called an ops group. And they're a set of people who, are both you know private pilots who are who are commercial pilots um, and also people who work for major airlines and they like despite the fact that they work for competitors they share information about you know here are the airports that are currently closed here's currently what's going on with the missile strike in Iran right like things like that and they share that information it makes all of them much more adaptable because they have the information that they need rather than siloing it. 
A thing that struck me while, while you all were talking about that, that, that I, I, I found funny was, not maybe not funny, but interesting was that how like the, the toilet paper thing reminded me instantly of the thundering herd problem we were talking about earlier, right? When we turn up services at the edge and then they hammer all the services on the inside and the whole system kind of goes into a flapping state for a long time. And, and it really see, it's really kind of weird to see that out in the real world. Um, so uh, if we're good with that, um, the next thing I had queued up was actually, you know, I, I want to do, I want to jump to somebody asked a question and I want to jump ahead to it a little bit because I think it's really relevant to where we are right now is um, how do you all see uh, the world of disaster response and business continuity planning changing as we move forward into recovery? Um, because I, I think right now a lot of folks are finding out that their disaster plans were incomplete because uh, nobody really planned for a pandemic or a lot of organizations didn't. Um, and there's a lot of need for doing using some of our, our recovery or our, our disaster planning that ha maybe hasn't been tested that well before. So um, if somebody wanted to kick off and start uh, talking about their thoughts on that. I think you can't enumerate every single possible thing that's going to go wrong, right? Like I think that going the playbook strategy is not necessarily going to work super well because you cannot anticipate what the next black swan is going to be, right? So instead we have to focus on making our organizations of people more resilient. I think that that's the lesson I hope people will take away from this. Uh, I was reading an article this morning uh, in the New York Times about how American Airlines had a plan for dealing with the pandemic in China. And they're like, yeah, we'll shut down flights to China. And then it spread to Italy and they're like, like, well, we can shut that down too, but that suddenly our plans no longer work, right? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Liz. You cannot game out every contingency. The, just the permutations are insane. Um, but failure modes cluster across just a handful of axes, right? So you can plan generally about how you're going to think through and respond to uh, sharp swings in capacity requirements, whether that's technical capacity like, you know, compute networking or human capacity, like we have to surge humans to a place or another. And those are generalized techniques and things you can plan for that are pretty portable across different situations. You can generally plan for like communication partition. What if the East Coast can't talk to the West Coast? What do we do there? Which is, um, what do we have to do if, uh, and you know, that, that rhymes with this problem of, oh, we can't send all the staff to a physical place at the same time because there's infection risk. Like that looks like a partition, a staff partition. So there are classes of things that you can drill and so that you at least have the mental framework of how to take these classes of things and apply them to the specifics of where you are. Um, I'll tell you a funny, uh, funny, whatever. Sure, let's call it funny, an anecdote. Um, I think some people might know, I will obviously Liz and Alex know, at Google, we do this thing called DIRT, uh, Disaster and Recovery Testing, where we like try to simulate the most existentially awful but plausible thing we can think of. Earthquakes or giant outages or whatever. Or zombie plagues. Well, I, you know, we did in fact simulate that one because, you know, zombies could happen. And um, when, when I would talk to people in the industry and they would find out about dirt, the reactions usually kind of went like this. Um, first reaction was, wow, that's kind of neat and it sounds kind of fun because it is kind of neat and it is kind of fun. And the second reaction is, but man, that is such a luxury item. It's not even like, of course Google does it because it's Google and whatever. Um, and so the good news is a lot of what we've learned in DIRT, we're actually having to apply, uh, not just can, like we're having to. The bad news is we are discovering all the vectors of terribleness that 20 years of DIRT testing did not prepare us for, or worse, miseducated us about. Uh, so we're, we're like unlearning some lessons rapidly too. So that's just a, anyway, it's a weird sort of dynamic. You, you would think a a company that spent 20 years thinking about crazy meteor strike kinds of things might be better prepared. And on some axes, we definitely are, but on other axes, it actually kind of hurt us. And so I don't know what lesson we'll learn from that, but we definitely need to learn some lessons from it. Yeah, and not only can you not plan for every potential outcome, you can't plan for every potential problem, you also can't plan for the scale, right? Like a good example I was reading last night that Waffle House is shutting down, 
Waffle House never shuts down. And, you know, part of that is capitalist greed, of course, blah, 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 blah. We don't have to get into that. But they take this seriously. They, every store or, you know, like every restaurant does training. Everyone that works there knows how to do this. They have reduced menus that they fall back onto. Uh, they are ready to help deliver things to people if they can't leave their houses. This is part of uh, how Waffle House has set themselves up. They, they have tried to ensure that they can be as resilient as a restaurant business possibly could. They're closing because sometimes even if you are as prepared as you possibly think you can be, you can't prepare for the scale of, of what you're dealing with either. And because I think that's kind of what's going on there. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting situation where Waffle House is used to hurricanes taking out like, you know, one or two or three states at a time, but they're not used to something affecting the entire nation at once with kind of no possibility of serving people a limited menu, right? What I found really fascinating about the Waffle House case is um, as a signal to to the people who live in this in those states that, that get hit by hurricanes frequently, that was a stronger signal that they had to batten down then the official warnings came out. And I was wondering if any of you had thoughts about, about that kind of like these uh, um, unofficial or kind of colloquial alert systems that maybe we already have in our organizations too. Uh, people love tea leaves. If there's something about human nature. I don't know exactly what it is. And someday there's maybe some body of research, but uh, I think there's a fundamental human distrust of authority, particularly authority that seems very abstracted uh, from you sort of in your locality. Uh, and I also think maybe makes people feel a little more in control uh, when they're like, oh, yes, I see this tea leaf that I can read. And so, yeah, things like uh, the Waffle, Waffle House uh, is a good local thing or in a lot of communities, whether Walmart is open or Walmart parking capacity is another kind of proxy measure in small towns people use it. There's just something about human nature where they love it. And, and it's the same thing um, in companies. Uh, people love anecdotes and love to pat and anecdotes are more viral than data uh, for sure. The, um, in a previous life, a long time ago, um, I worked in the U S intelligence community and we used to say that um, the three great sources of, of uh, intelligence for any uh, group, was SIGINT, signals intelligence, HUMINT, human intelligence, stuff you'd get from spies or whatever, but the most powerful was RUMINT, um, you know, what you heard in rumors. And you know, there's just something about human nature that's weird. And so as leaders, it's really interesting and hard because on the one hand, you wanna be making decisions based on well-curated and aggregated data. On the other hand, you have this human instinct to wanna to pay attention to anecdotes and you have to find some filtration mechanism to mix and munge them together. And the higher you are, like the more challenging the problem becomes. So I guess to spin that on its head, what can we do as leaders to kind of communicate the doing the right things to our people when our people are disinclined, are disinclined to believe what we say at face value? I mean, I think part of that is you use narratives, right? Not only do people like these signals that Dave was talking about, people like stories. We've always been storytellers. That's that's how, for the vast majority of humans having existed, that's that's how we passed information via stories, and that's why the best postmortems are narratives and not timelines. And uh, yeah, we goodness. I'm after this after this pandemic, we're going to have to really stop using the word postmortem. We're going to have to start yeah. using retrospective because now, like postmortem, does feel like um like people are going to have like relatives who have died recently, and that's a little bit on too on the nose. Yeah, I've actually yeah, yeah. renamed things as incident retrospective internally, and I like it a lot better. But there's still, right, we've been calling it postmortems for decades in this industry. It can be difficult to kind of get, jump onto a new phrase, but totally agree. There's an old saying um, among um, like marketers and people who have to persuade people for a living. So this is really piggyback on Alex's point because he makes a really important point that. Um, Identity beats analogy, analogy beats logic, and logic beats nothing, right? And so when you're making an argument, um, if you're arguing against nothing, if you're arguing against the vacuum, you can use facts and data and logic and you're gonna win the argument. Uh, and if you're making an argument and uh, what you're arguing against are, let's say, a set of facts that can be interpreted a bunch of ways, 
that analogy turns out to be a stronger way to persuade people. And the strongest way to persuade people is identity. Um, and in fact, like you'll, this is going to change the way you look at advertising. But if you look at any long form advertising, it always goes in what's known as the up and down pyramid. It starts with identity. Like, don't you want to be known as a, you know, handsome, sophisticated, suave human being? And, uh, and then it'll like go down to uh, an analogy. After that, like, imagine you were a, you know, an elegant animal in a herd, or I don't know, some crappy uh, analogy people make for men's clothing or something. And then data, 46% of all employers love people with blue ties. And then it works back up, it, you know, it reinforces with an analogy and then an identity again. And that is the arc of every piece of long, successful long form presentation. And there's something to Alex's point about human nature where we value stories. Maybe they are easier to compress and store in our brain or it's something about the way they, they, they interact with our ability to abstract think, or maybe they're sort of pre-chewed in the sense that if you give me data, I have to chew through it and look for knowledge and then look for wisdom and then synthesize it into a thing in storage. Whereas if you just give me a story, I can just pull a moral out of it. Mm. Um, I think what's particularly interesting here, though, is we had heard those stories, right, for months, right? We'd been hearing from, from countries in Asia who were impacted, and countries that were outside of Asia chose to ignore those stories, which I think brings us back to the idea of identity, right? Like, if you think that your identity is such that that story has no relevance to you, you're not going to pay attention to that story. Yeah, but I think part of that, too, is the way those stories were presented to us here was numbers, Right. It was just news reports like X number of people now you know, got infected, Y number have died, Z number have you know, have recovered. I'm sure there was much better data out there and there were better stories being told out there, but that's how I grew I was receiving the news at least. Right. It was just numbers again. Numbers from a place I've never been. And I think that's one of the reasons it was probably easy for people to not take it seriously, because as Dave was saying, it's the uh, stories work better. And that's good. I'm always telling people. A good SRE understands marketing because you need to get other people to buy onto what you're selling, either in terms of a system, how do you think about reliability, or I think this tool is a really good idea, or we should be focusing on this. You know, you need to know how to market. And to do that, you need to be able to tell stories. Uh, last year, spent a lot of time um, trying to convince uh, people to spend a lot of money on a certain vendor. And uh, I tried using numbers at first, like, hey, we need this like we need X number of engineers to build the same functionality internally. So like that salary cost would far outweigh what it cost to just like pay this vendor to do it. And that didn't get me anywhere. But then during our trial phase, when someone was able to actually solve a problem, when I told that story, when I said this human on this team did this thing, that was what was able to help convince leadership. Yeah, it's hoping I, I want to have that I, aha moment. I think another thing that, that we probably deal with a lot in, in our spaces and work is we are very uh, biased um, toward understanding the numbers. And a, a book I keep thinking about a lot lately is in numeracy and how, you know, if, if I said to the three of you, I said, oh, yeah, it's going on an exponential curve. You would go, oh, yeah, that's an exponential curve. It looks like this. Right. <laughs> but for, for the majority of people, if we say it's going to go exponential, they go like, is that like adding more or? I think for, for like large population uh, broadcast. And so I think it's, that's a really key skill for SREs. It's also worse than that. Um, all humans, even really math savvy humans are terrible at internalizing and dealing with probabilities. Uh, I, have, uh, I, I believe firmly that humans really only understand two probabilities, zero and one. And, and everything else is, is kind of a mental coin toss. And most people reduce risks to either zeros or one, you know, like um, entrepreneurs uh, too often reduce risks to zero and, and pessimists, let's say, um, too often reduce risks uh, to one. And that's it. That's all people understand. And so like you see this thing where um, even in the in like the press reporting and the public discussion over the pandemic, you'll have some people saying, well, uh, you know, we could be through it by this date. And other people say, no, 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 it'll take us much, much longer than this. And that's insane. And actually, the truth of the matter is, is that the probability of any one of those scenarios being true um, is roughly the same. And no one knows which one's going to happen. And so, you know, whether you tend to be an optimistic person or, or maybe a pessimist who can't count, just depends on how you look at the world. 
um, or a pessimistic person, depends on which scenario you, you gravitate to. And I, people have a really hard time accepting that two or three or four different outcomes are all equally plausible. And therefore things that feel like they're conflicting can all be simultaneously true. And they have a really hard time figuring out then like, what do I do? In that scenario. And I think that this is where we have a role as people who think about preparedness, right? To prepare for each of those three or four scenarios, right? What would it take to adapt under this scenario versus that scenario? Once you have that concrete menu of options, that feels like a much more reducible problem than, than you know, dealing with black swans. But I think we do have to deal with black swans too. Yeah, I, a thing that I noticed a lot, I've been trying to introduce, uh, you know, better knowledge of basic statistics and using probability. These are very uh, powerful tools for calculating meaningful SLIs and picking good SLO targets and stuff. And what I learned is that some of the most technical people, yeah, they have real trouble grasping simple probability concepts. Um, it's just not easy for human brains to do. Um, like you may accept the fact that there's a chance that no deck of cards has ever been shuffled in the same way. Right, because if you do the math, uh, you know it. There are just there's trillions, or you know, I can't remember, you know, like what the number is now. But there's so many possible outcomes that there's a chance that no two decks have ever been shuffled in the same way. You might know that via math, but it, it I, I don't even really believe that, right? Like it, it's 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 one thing to have numbers, and it's another thing to actually convince human brains of things, right? Like the Monty Hall problem, I think, is another great one. It's pretty simple to prove that, you know. Uh, here, like I'll explain it. So it, it was based on an old game show and there was a gift behind one door and behind two other doors were donkeys, I believe, or something like that. Um, and basically once you pick a door, one of the two remaining doors would be opened and you'd get to find out what was behind that door. And if it was a donkey, as, the, you know, like as opposed to the gift, you were allowed to switch which door you had picked. Intuitively, we all want to say that it doesn't make any difference, but it does. You increase your chances of getting the gift if you switch the door again. And it's incredibly counterintuitive, but you can find this on Wikipedia and you can find the mathematical proofs. From a probability standpoint, if a door is opened and there's a donkey behind it and you've already selected, move, choose the other door. You actually have a better chance. This makes no sense. It's very difficult for humans. It really doesn't. <laughs> The other thing um, is I find um, people have a pretty good intuition about expected value. You know, there's a 30% chance of this outcome and a 70% chance of this other outcome. And so we weight them together and then the expected value is some number that actually doesn't appear in any of the outcome tables, right? Um, and, and so uh, they have a pretty good intuition about expected value but it turns out in a lot of these situations, the expected value is not useful for making a decision. Um, so if you have a 30% chance of living and a 70% chance of dying for this one particular patient, um, and we, we, we say, you know, living is, you know, a value of one and dying is a value of zero, then, you know, you have an expected value of 0.3, which does nothing to the decision process because it's not one of the actual outcomes. Right, exactly. I've been having to tell people, right, like, you know, a 3% death rate or even like, you know, like a 1% death rate among people who are, who are able-bodied and, and younger, right? Like, you know, that means that every company is going to either lose someone or is going to lose a relative of someone working at the company, right? That makes it a lot more concrete. It makes it more than just, just maths. But I think all of this is kind of wrapping back around to the idea that when we think about reliability, when we think about risks, that a lot of it revolves around kind of persuading people of it rather than necessarily kind of just, just the math. Totally. All right. So that brings us to uh, about 17 minutes left. So we're going to move on to Q&A. And so the first one I have overlaps a little bit with, with what we were talking about earlier, but it has a little twist. Um, so given the view that humans and technology are part of the same system, sudden staffing reductions can deeply impact these systems. For example, and this is the part that I like, the loss of expertise. How can SREs proactively help prepare our organizations to adapt for this? 
I talk a lot in my talks about the idea of collaboration, right? Like that the idea that we need to not silo knowledge, which means that you have to have more than one person with a working knowledge of like, how does something work? How do we do things? Uh, why do we do things? Um, so I think that that's kind of one redundancy mechanism that we can really employ to guard against the possibility of someone becoming, going to the hospital and not being available. I think part of it is also just proactivity on people who know that they can be thought of as the subject matter expert or a single point of failure. People often know that. And you need to encourage people to, uh, when you see yourself as that person, when you know that you are the only one that, that, that holds this data, that you need to proactively share this. There's an exercise you can do as a team, which I do on my teams. Um, I talked about this I don't know, a few months ago at Chaos Conference. Um, one of the exercises is called Wheel of Staycation, um, where every week you randomly pick a person. I go into much more detail, but uh, you can look it up. But you randomly pick a person, and they stay at work, but they have no work communication. Like that becomes their day to do project work or whatever it is, but they can't answer any work emails. They can't any IMs, no in-person questions, nothing. Uh, and the point of the exercise is to discover your information spots. Like what questions couldn't get answered? Just because that one person randomly wasn't there that one day, that one week. Uh, and then to actively engineer the, uh, the information spots. Uh, there are other things you can do. But the only way you can, um, you can discover things like expertise spots or information spots is to regularly and routinely exercise them before the emergency shows up. And there are a set of exercises you can do to make this happen. The other thing that this made me think of is how probably a lot of SREs are those experts that have a lot of critical knowledge in their head for, for how the infrastructure is held together and like where, how all the pieces are connected. And so probably our community is especially um, loaded with this kind of information. Yeah, and you know, like on a technical standpoint, this is tangential, I guess, but something I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, I'm gonna work from home more often, not because I necessarily love it, but because I need to make sure I can. Right? Like so many companies reported uh, running out of VPN licenses because they never expected every single employee to have to log in at the same time. And even if they had enough VPN licenses, was the subnet used to assign to the clients large enough? And even if that subnet was large enough, were there enough DHCP leases available? Right? There's so many different things that you need to you know, like think about that if you're being a little bit more proactive and you're kind of testing scenarios and right, like you have exercises like what Dave mentioned, uh, these are all good things that can help you learn. Yeah, we had a really interesting thing that really prepared us for this at Honeycomb in that we were concerned about potentially losing our office lease back in September or October and not having the cash to put down a deposit on a new office. This was before we raised our, our most recent round. And as a result, the company instituted like, you know, one week out of every eight weeks, we're just going to all work from home that week just to get us ready for this uh, mentality of we might lose our office. And we didn't lose our office the way we expected to lose our office, I'll tell you that. So I have another question um, uh, that, uh, about uh, remote work leading into that. So when all the forced remote people are told that they can return to their office, what proportion of them do you think will say, no thanks? I'm used to this now and I like it better. Please don't make me go back to the office. So this is incredibly anecdotal, but like I have this social slack. It's just me and just me and my friends. You know, it's been around for a few years. It's, it's, it's like a glorified group chat at this point, right? we appear to be split 50-50 on who misses the office and who doesn't. We're split just about 50-50 on who has always wanted to work from home or does, and you know who, who would really like for things to get back to normal, you know, like in that sense. Purely anecdotal, very small sample size, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's something close to that. A lot of people have noticed that after a week or so, they really miss the human interaction. And there's other people who are very happy just to be indoors. I'm really curious to see whether this expands the range of people hiring outside of San Francisco, though. I think that overall, though, this crisis is really exposing the need for people's tooling to support remote workflows, for people to not need to be you know, shoulder surf surfing each other in order to collaborate. And kind of the sooner companies can adapt to that reality and adapt solutions that enable people to collaborate without being physically in the same place, the better prepared they'll be for any scenario, including hiring remote employees, including this crisis dragging on longer. And yes, including people not wanting to go back to the office.
Yeah, I, I expect something like a hundred percent of the people, or a very very high percentage of the people who are working remotely, will go back to the go back to the office that first week, right? Um, like, I'm a raging introvert. Um, I'm fine not dealing with humans. Um, but even I'm going kind of nuts. And so I'm definitely going to go back to the office the first week. And then I think, then I see it's like a double boomerang. So a bunch of people are like, oh, okay, now I have a side-by-side -side comparison, you know, in recent timeline. I think I'm going to three days a week, if, if the company will permit it, uh, whatever, work from home. Um, I, I also share Liz's hope um, that this will make companies bolder uh, about where they are hiring people and where they'll allow hire people to be hired, uh, that would be awesome but for all the reasons, right? You know, de de-densification and decongestion and, and just generally making things more affordable and better for people. That'll be like, Google, where I work, Google has a very strong culture of in-person. It's just, that's the way the company was built. Yeah, I know, I did, you know, sometimes drives me nuts too, Liz, but I'm just saying. And, um, and not just that, but you know, for some roles, Bay Area. Like when I interviewed, uh, I was living on the East Coast near Washington D.C., and I said to the person hiring, you know, like, hey, you know, you have an office 15 minutes from my house, and the job you're hiring me for is a globally distributed job with teams across the world. How about I just do the job uh, from Reston? Uh, and her answer was, that is a really fantastic and interesting point. By the way, the job is in Mountain View, and. Um, so I, it, it'll be really interesting for like a company like ours with that strong geographic affinity thing to see if we learn any of these lessons or take this as an opportunity, let's say, to uh, relax some of those constraints. That, that's, that's a thing I'm really looking forward to, a conversation I'm really looking forward to seeing. It's also interesting seeing the kind of back and forth, at least in larger SRE orgs that are multi-homed, right? That they already have some of these skills in order to collaborate across time zones, just not necessarily being remote in the same time zone. I think there's two questions I think are very similar, so I'm going to combine them, and that'll probably be our last. Well, we got about 10 minutes left. So, in um, so the first one is, if people think that something can happen only once, do you think they're capable of learning from this incident? If we kind of call this all one big incident, and the second one is that I think is related. In two years' time, when we aren't directly talking about this anymore, what impacts to the way we work do you hope will have stuck? And so I think those two are very re related. Like, what are we going to like, are people going to, do you feel like people are going to learn from this? I think everybody here has a lot of experience with trying to educate people coming out of incidents and sometimes very large incidents. And then like, what do you think is going to stick? I actually think that, uh, I know this is contrary to what a lot of people think, but in my experience, uh, spending 18 years in tech in one way, you know, like where the other people actually expect things to be the same. Uh, things that they've seen happen before, they expect to happen again. I think even something of this magnitude, people are going to remember that this can happen. So I, I, I don't think people will actually view a problem as large as this as, as, like as a one-off. Um, people have trouble categorizing things as black swan events. They will always go back to when a new problem happens, they did, oh, well, is this the same problem we saw back in October? Or is this the same problem we saw last year? Um, even if that problem never pops its head up again, people instinctively, they expect the future to look like the past. We can still pick out micro patterns that might happen again, right? Like, you know, people rushing to the grocery store to hoard, right? People all happening to get on Zoom at the same time from the same country, right? Like, you know, these are things that we potentially can learn from. Uh, at, at Google, you know, when Alex, Dave, and I were all at Google at the same time, right? Like, there's this wiki page on the on the Google in, internal wiki, wiki docs that say, like, something like formative outages, right? Like, and you can hear about, you know, all of the black swan outages that Google has had over the past 10 years, and like, which ones were the most influential? Which one should you know as a new SRE? And that way, I'm actually less worried about what people who live through this are going to learn. I'm more worried about what happens to the next generation of SREs who have not lived through this. What, how can we communicate what we've learned from this to them? So that's the most valuable thing, I think. I agree with Alex and Liz. I have no fear that uh, people will learn lessons from this. And Alex is right. Everyone's uh, tendency towards recency bias is going to keep this fresh in minds. Also, um, this isn't rare. Um, just in the last 10 years, right? We've had SARS and MERS and H1N1 and this, and 
This one broke out faster and the reaction was sort of more uh, swift and loud, let's say, and so with swine flu, but like every couple of years, something like this either happens or is on the verge of happening. So this isn't nearly as black swan as people think. I 100% think companies are gonna learn these lessons, or, or really and truly do. Um, the ones who don't will self-select for extinction. Um, what you wanna see happen though, is that the lessons they learn go into the culture, just into the culture of being at the company. So that to Liz's point, the next generation of SREs or employees in general, like it's just part of the culture um, that whatever, remote work is part of the culture or you know, capacity planning is part of the culture or whatever, whatever is part of the culture. That's, that's the most useful thing we can do from here is to, add, is to ask what principles, what practices, what cultural norms do we want to drive into our companies so that the next generations don't have to remember the specifics of this incident to get the value of what we learned from it. Kind of like an immune system, right? Like, you know, the immune system remembers things. But yeah. I, do say, I don't think it's necessarily the case that every company is going to learn anything from this or they're going to learn the opposite lesson, right? There are plenty of examples of companies who are just waiting on a bailout and they always were. Like you're not going to convince me that the current setup of our airlines is actually going to change any of their practices moving forward unless we put in regulations to change how they make decisions. Uh, like same with our banks. Until we can regulate things better, they're just always going to wait for a bailout next time that they fail. That's why or you know all the buybacks happening in aviation and you know uh, Boeing knows that the government's always going to bail them out because our economy cannot survive without them, unfortunately. And there's ways around this, but. Just want to point out, it's also not necessarily going to be the case that everyone currently impacted is actually going to change their practices. I don't, I, you know, like I don't think there's always going to be outliers. There's always going to be problem actors. So you're saying is we need to hand the pager back to those organizations and, and stop bailing them out. <laughs> yeah, like I, but, like that's yeah, what you made me think of when you were talking about that, right? Like, is is that that that's our equivalent? Is if we keep bailing out service teams, they, they're never going to really learn to to swim for themselves. And sometimes it's, here's your pager. Good luck. We're here to support you. And, and you're starting to, see, you know, and, and the good news is, is they're not independent actors. They act in an ecosystem. They have externalities in, in the form of government intervention and regulation. So a lot of the many, let's do that, of the loopholes and laxities that were in, uh, for example, the 2008-2009 bailout TARP don't exist in the set of bills that just passed, I think just passed um, the, the US Congress. Um, because people remember and they learned some lessons and they were like, yeah, no, um, you don't get to do that. We saw you do that last time. You don't get to do that this time. And companies will invent new and creative ways to, to do something else. But the good news is it's like there is a feedback loop for a bunch of these things. I think the other element is like, you know, reducing over the long term, the amount of too big to fail, right? Like, can we save specific things that are essential while not saving the things that are, you know, that are frivolous? Yeah, sharding for the As far as commerce is concerned, yeah. I mean, I think it's important to remember, we use the term complex system a lot in this industry. And when we do, people's mind often goes to, you know, I don't know, like some kind of microservice mesh where a bunch of things are talking to each other. But like, that's, you know, a very old concepts that, you know, other engineering disciplines have been using for a very long time. Like, you know, everything is a complex system, uh, not, and it doesn't even have to be a, a thing, right? I'm not just talking about the fact that an airplane is a complex system or a bridge, but our political system is, right? Uh, our economic system is, uh, individual organisms are, and you can apply the same ways of how you think about your complex microservice system. You can apply how you think about things to our political system. We're also going to have to unlearn some interesting th lessons we thought we had learned. Um, one of the arguments for the distribution of global manufacturing across a lot of different countries, rather than concentrating in, in you know, heavily in one country or another, was the thought about resiliency. Like I remember very clearly in the late '80s and early '90s, the debates around NAFTA and other trade agreements were, "Hey, this is going to create resiliency." Um, so that we're not just dependent on, you know, wherever in the United States or someplace in Taiwan or whatever. And um, we should have I, learned that lesson a long time ago, right? Like the floods in Thailand that took out a whole part, portion of hard drive manufacturing, right? Like these are 
Yeah, but that's but those, that was a lesson only like the tech industry learned. You know, like that was too localized to to cause a, a global conversation. Let's say. And but so one of the lessons we're learning now is oh, actually, you know, having some capacity sharding across different like maybe we don't want to concentrate, I don't know, the production of all of our antibiotics to the lowest cost provider, because it tends to concentrate in one place geographically, just as an example. And so maybe making it a little more expensive, but charting it across a lot of different places will be better. So we're learning, we're learning that some things we thought we understood about a global supply chains uh, were wrong, and now we have to adjust them. And so that'll be a really interesting thing to watch happen. Awesome. Well, that's, that's time for us, everyone. And uh, so thank you so much to our attendees and uh, especially a huge thanks to our panelists, Liz, Dave, and Alex. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate your insights and had a great time. Uh, I hope everyone had a great time on this panel. Uh, we're hoping to do more of these in the future. Um, we, if you have more ideas for how we can connect with our community, I think the three of us are on Twitter. I'll probably ask the folks to put our handles out there on the Blameless account again, just to make sure it's easy to find. I'm Miss Amy Toby, T-O-B-E-Y. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you all. So stay safe, healthy, and uh, stay home. Bye, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much.